In 1966, less than a month after the brutal slaying of eight student nurses in Chicago, another mass murder took place on the serene campus of the University of Texas. The mad killer in this case was a man named Charles J. Whitman, who on the outside seemed like your all-American male. However, inside Whitman, there burned an angry rage, a rage that would one day send him on a killing spree that would stun the world. As a young boy growing up in Florida, it seemed like Whitman was always around guns. As a hobby, he liked to shoot target practice and go hunting. His father, Charles A. Whitman, was a successful plumbing contractor who emphasized strict discipline in his household. One person he didn't have to worry about was Charles, who was described by some as a perfectionist. By the age of 12, he had become an Eagle Scout, quite an achievement at such a young age. After graduating from high school, Charles joined the Marines in 1959, where he developed into a superb marksman with a rifle. During his military service, he attended the University of Texas on an ROTC scholarship. There he met Kathleen Leisner, a student who was studying to become a teacher. In 1962, Charles and Kathy were married. For Charles Whitman, who was an honest student in engineering, everything seemed to be falling into place. Unknown to most people, however, Charles would, at times, become extremely hostile, even beating his wife for no apparent reason. He often expressed resentment of his father for being such a domineering parent. His father, he claimed, had beaten his mother several times, and Charles was afraid he was becoming the same way. In 1966, Whitman received a phone call from his mother in Florida telling him that they had just become separated. At her request, Charles went down to Florida, picked her up, and drove her back to Austin, Texas, so she would be near her son. The separation of his parents upset Charles greatly, and his resentment of his father increased. A month later, at the urging of his wife, Charles saw a psychiatrist. There, Whitman explained how he was suffering from sudden bursts of hostility for no real reason. The doctor made another appointment for Charles, but he would never return. On the night of July 31st, 1966, Whitman went into an unexplainable rage. First, he went to his mother's house and stabbed her to death. Then he went home and waited for his wife. When Kathy showed up, he murdered her in the same brutal way. The next morning, Whitman headed out to the school's administration building, armed with an assortment of guns and ammunition. As he ascended the 30-story building, he clubbed and shot to death three people who were in his path. When he reached the top, he prepared to launch an attack on the unsuspecting public below. Whitman's strategic positioning not only gave him complete access to the surrounding area, but it also provided him protection from any gunfire below. The sharpshooting ex-Marine freely fired away with his high-powered rifle. In just 10 minutes, he managed to kill 10 people and wound 31. Once the police became aware, they fired back, pinning Whitman down behind one of the walls. The gun battle lasted for nearly 90 minutes before the police stormed the tower and killed the mad gunman named Charles J. Whitman. Now the big puzzle remained. Why did he do it? What caused this man to turn his inner rage into a mass execution of innocent people? After killing his mother and wife, he then turned his hostility toward society itself. The 10 who died were unsuspecting citizens, unaware that a killer with a long-range rifle had targeted them for death. It was one of the worst mass murders of the century. Whitten was the one close example, particularly the last part of his killings, to a mass murder. In a short period of time, he begins to kill people for apparently no reason at all. Uh, it is similar to other mass murders that have taken place. The first or second killing seems to be m somewhat understood. We can vaguely empathize with those. But after the second or the third, the killings seem to have no purpose at all. He's into a world of killing simply for the sake of killing. No erotic pleasure that I can see, no other type of pleasures that would motivate us. But it is killing until he is finally caught by the police, killed by the police, 
And then you throw up your hands and say, why in the world did he do that? And the answer is, nobody knows why he did that. The once serene campus of the University of Texas had now been turned into chaos. Even the majestic clock tower, once the symbol of this school's proud heritage, had been transformed into a monument of death. Whitman's body was taken for examination to see if perhaps there was some biological reason for his behavior. As it turned out, the doctors discovered a tumor in his brain that could have been putting pressure on his aggressive nerve center. Some people used this discovery as the explanation for Whitman's insane behavior. Why people like the idea of a brain tumor is because it's a simple, commonsensical, easily observable uh, reason for behavior. I look, I see a tumor, and that causes behavior. I look at speck in some way and see an XYY chromosome. But how do you see jealousy, unhappiness, being defeated by life, sexual lust, and so forth? These things are not easily observed or understood. But something like a tumor makes sense. Something like a peculiar chromosome makes sense. I don't think they account for much in these cases. But people want simple answers because these are simple people. They're, after all, only murderers. And murderers are simple to understand. Of course, they're not. But we want such a simple thing to explain his. Did, that, did the tumor explain both the killing of the mother and his wife? We roughly understand that. And the killing of total strangers the next day. What a remarkable tumor that must be. To, to have driven him to such peculiar behavior. 